Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier here in the Palo Alto studios uh, with two great guests, Tara Slotowski, who's the founder and CEO of Iridescent and, and our Simpson Global and that ambassador of Technovation. Guys, thanks for coming in today. Appreciate uh, moving your schedules around to come in. Um, thanks for coming into our studio. You bet. Yeah. So Sindar Pakai was at your event. Uh, that's the big story this past week has been the Google memo from a low-level employee um, who wrote some things that got the whole world shaking around. Uh, gender biases, role of women in tech, and as we do a lot of women in tech, as you know, with theCUBE, uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, women in over the years, friends, and also smart people. Um, this is a pretty big moment for you guys. You had an event at Google. Sundar canceled his all-hands meeting to address this under fear of re retaliation and, and safety, but came to your event on the Google campus. Um, surprising to many, it was written up on Recode uh, and The Verge. Um, pretty notable. So tell us about what happened. Go ahead. Um, so, so yeah, this was the 2017 Technovation World Pitch uh, competition and the award ceremony. And uh, Sundar came and he talked to a lot of the girls who were presenting their ideas to solve problems in their community. And then um, he had a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one conversation to learn a little bit more about the kinds of problems, their interest in technology entrepreneurship. And then uh, he addressed the crowd of 900 plus supporters and really re-emphasized that uh, there's a place for women in technology and more importantly for him and uh, Google that there's a place for these girls at Google. Talk about your mission. Right, um, so Technovation's mission is to empower girls to become technology entrepreneurs, and it's much more than just learning how to code. It's really about seeing girls um, and telling girls that if there's a problem in their community, technology can help them have a very powerful voice. We've been running for eight years, and Anar is our global ambassador who has helped us grow to more than 100 countries. But um, it, Technovation's um, relationship with Google is eight years long. Uh, Google has supported Technovation, was the very first technology company to support Technovation way before any other company saw the potential. And since then, since 2010, Google has provided funding, mentors, spaces, not just across the U.S., but globally. Is it beyond entrepreneurship and beyond coding? I mean, talk about specifically what you guys are bringing to uh, folks outside of Silicon Valley. Oh, sure. So, um, you know, my role as the global ambassador for Technovation um, is really go getting to girls all over the world and saying to them, um, you need to be engaged in technology. And what we found, as Tara mentioned, uh, we've been doing this now, I've been doing this now for five years, is that we're building uh, a movement. We're bringing in girls, uh, we're bringing in mentors, we're bringing in companies and governments together uh, to make this a reality for, um, for girls in tech careers in their own countries. What are, what's some examples of in, during your life where you had those kind of change moments? I think um, iridescent, we are now in our 12th year and um, every, every couple of months it's a change moment because it's a test of grit and just believing in yourself because, I mean, I started it with just an idea and grew it to be an organization that's all over the world and it doesn't come with just, just full-hearted focus and a lot of courage is what I've seen. I think um, I've also seen that how much you are passionate about an idea really swings how the other person is thinking. And so the idea only matters so much. I think it's, of course, I mean, the track record and everything has to be there. But I think a lot of it depends on your own passion for it. And I think I've come to realize that passion is maybe proportional to the complexity and the and the impact of the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're only trying to um, solve a small problem, you lose interest in two years, right? And maybe that's why, I'm always curious, like why do so many startups fail after two or three years? It's because maybe you came in not thinking that you're gonna change the world. Maybe you came in because you wanted to make quick money or exit or whatever. And so I think for me, it's this is my life's work and we wanna bring, bring more underrepresented communities into innovation, and so this is not something that's going to be solved easily. Yeah. Let's get back to the Sundar event that you guys were having. I think this is a good conversation to have because one of the things that came out of the brouhaha that became that memo really was a, a conversation publicly. Now, it's been polarizing, there's been some kind of a hate, hate kind of mindset with it most of the time. Plenty of stuff on the internet to go read there, but there was actually some good conversations in the industry. 
what was the conversation like during the event? Because this was in full full conversation mode while you guys were having your 2017 World Pitch Competition, of which he presided mm-hmm. over and had a speech to the, to the uh, entrepreneurs. What was it like? What were some of the conversations that were taking place? I think um, the most powerful piece of the whole evening was really the girls walking in and seeing the incredible diversity that we have in this world, right? So we had girls from and, and mentors and supporters from over 30 countries and just the, them coming and waving the flags and different faces and different cultures, all trying to make the world a better place. I mean, it's rare that you see that using technology. And I think it's very fitting that Silicon Valley is the center of this. But um, I think... I think there was not one dry eye in the in the in the group because you realize it's the conversation is so much bigger than one company, one country. It is something that affects us as all human beings, and you're believing in human potential. So I think seeing these young girls, some of them ten years old, mm-hmm. there was this. I think maybe the crowd's favorite was um, these ten-year-old girls from Cambodia yes. who want to uh, <laughs> improve sort of the lives of these people working in cottage industries, right? And they they created an app like say Etsy or something, but focused on Cambodian products and the courage of these little girls. I think everybody walks away feeling, okay, there's hope. There's it, even in the midst of all of this yeah. discussion. Yeah, it creates a, a lightning rod in some ways and hopefully we'll, we'll move on to the, the substantive conversations. How do you guys feel about what happened? And as you take this mission forward, yeah. um, you guys are doing some amazing work and we'll do a whole nother segment, I think that's on that in a minute. but. Given the landscape now, how do you view this, and how do you how are you talking with friends and colleagues and family members around it? Because I've certainly had certainly conversations with with uh, my friends, certainly on the East Coast. Like, no, no, that's not the way Silicon Valley is. <laughs> Google actually is a very cool company. It's not exactly like what you think it is. They're very open. Uh, they support a lot of great initiatives, and they're candid. And, and, and then I go on to explain. It's like a university. Sergey and Larry have this little little uh, ecosystem that they've kind of built a university culture, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's open and. There's things that happen that get misrepresented. Uh, that was my, my take. Uh, that's for the folks that don't know Silicon Valley. But what's your take? What do you think about what's happened? Um, so this is really, really good that you brought up the university campus um, uh, you know, uh, environment of it. So I have two girls. They're both millennials, and they're both in the tech world. Um, and we had this discussion. And here, here's the perfect answer, right? Uh, so one of my daughters, um, Kat, she said that you know, when she read that, she thought it was basically a gathering of his thoughts, and it was a gathering of his thoughts because he was probably uh, asked to adhere to uh, IND uh, stuff that's going on in every company right now, right? And so it was like a little bit of a, wait a second, you know, he, he's, he wants to sort of um, respond to his being asked to go to IND stuff. And then Katya said, but you know, mom, it was just a gathering of his thoughts, and if this, this is an essay, and it was a poorly written one. And if I was grading it, I would give him a C minus. Then my older daughter said, "Oh, he'll give him an F on that one." Right? Board, C minus. She's generous. See, like no, because he, he did. He tried to make yeah. it very yeah. professional and very academic. And she said, "But it was uh, a first draft. He has not. You know, he didn't proceed to uh, toughen it up, solid, solidify it, find more evidence. Um, you know, have it critiqued. It was just a gathering of his thoughts, and he hasn't gone through the process." And, both these girls graduated from Berkeley, and so I think they would know what a C paper looks like versus an A paper. And then my older daughter said, and the other thing is, um, you know, it's not, it's not like um, IND efforts are actually bad, but, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to condense the time in which we're trying to get women uh, at, the, at equal pairing in the tech world. Now, you know, women have never been at equal pairing in many professions. There were not enough doctors, lawyers, accountants, um, you name it, right? Main Street, Wall Street has never had equality. And now we're looking at technology, and the reason everything just flares up in technology is because we live in today's world where news and information is available all the time. Um, so there's two things going on. Uh, information is readily avail- available. People can come into the conversation very quickly, and whenever anything happens in Silicon Valley, the effect is massive because all eyes are are on Silicon Valley all the time. So it's it's a bit of a distorted view, but we have gone through this. It took a long time for women to become uh, astronauts. It took a long time for women to become neurosurgeons. It took a long time for women to become lawyers and dentists. 
it will take a little bit of time for women to become top technologists, but we're hoping that it'll shorten and things happen quickly in the valley and we're trying to get that quicker and so we're seeing a little bit of friction. This is responses from millennials. So for me, it was like, Interesting yes. perspective. Yes, great perspective. And when Sooner said these things, um, you know, at, at the world pitch, I was sitting in the second row and every time he said something, I would clap like really loud and Todd said, why are you being so good? And I said, I need to hear that. I need to hear him say that because... What did he say that moved you? Oh, he just said, you know, you have a place in technology. And I said, yes, we needed to hear you say that right away, yeah. all the time, and especially to these girls, these 8 to 18-year-old girls, and all of the ones that come from 100 countries that weren't at, at Google, but were listening to the live pitch. We seem to be going back to a, a, a crowd that wants to see respect for the individual and citizenship. These were company values that you look back at when I was there that I always remembered was unique. They go, hey, you can have differences, but if you have respect for the individual and you have a citizenship mindset, that seems to have been lost in tech. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. with the whole, this whole movement you see, and you know, win at all costs, you know, being an asshole, what, what, what you got to do to be a CEO, mm -hmm. or you know, flip it fast, or you know, Rose program. You know, so it became a very mm -hmm. selfish environment. It seems to be shifting now with this conversation. Your thoughts? So I, I have to say, um, you know, doing a startup is not easy. Um, getting successful in this world is not easy. Um, shaking um, the status quo is not easy. So I have to say that um, the same people, and you know, we're not going to name names, but the same people who are, um, y you know, very arrogant and and have little uh, respect for the laws and rules. They have given us products that are changing people's lives. There is no question yeah. about it. Um, without their bravado, without their um, um, sort of, um, you know, I don't care, I'm just gonna go over you if you don't yeah. uh, comply with me. Uh, you know, a lot of um, ride sharing wouldn't even have happened. Yeah. And uh, to me, when you provide employment, when you provide alternative services, when you provide something that um, takes away the way things were, I see that as a plus, okay? I think what we're seeing is that's needed to a certain extent, and then you realize, okay, now we have to get back to growing it yeah. and working it, and if you keep going in that mode, you probably won't succeed. So being tough and determined and having grit yes. is what you need to break through those walls as a startup. You don't need to be necessarily a jerk. But your point is, if you're creating value. If you're creating value, and, and that sometimes you actually have to be a jerk, because there are very few brave, non-jerk people who have gone against yeah. uh, big unions and big monopolies, right? You and I, like, I would not be able to go against the taxi commission. You need somebody who is a complete a-hole to do that. Yeah. And he did that, and it made a difference. Yeah. He doesn't have to continue to do that, and that's... that's there was the a meme point. going around the internet, if you want to make friends, sell ice cream. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. so you can't always win friends when you're pioneering right. Uh, things. Right, right. And, and, you know, th there is a balance, and maybe, maybe we've, um, we've fostered the fact that you need to be um, that attitude for everything, and that's not true. So, you know, the pendulum shifted a bit too much. But I think you shouldn't, that we shouldn't scorn them, <laughs> because really they have made a difference. Let's just let it's everybody a, it's, get it's back a, it's to... It's a tough world out there to survive, and you have to have that, that kind of elbow, so. el sharp elbows to make things happen. I think so. And, but it's the value you're providing and how you do it. Exactly. It's an I mean, question too. Yeah. Also, yeah. well, it's no secret to the folks that know me and watch the cube and know the Silicon Valley that I'm a huge proponent for computer science. And you know, as kind of someone who kind of fell into that in the '80s, it's now become very interesting in that the surface area for computer science has increased a lot. And it's not just you know coding and heads down and squashing bugs and writing code. Yeah. There's been a whole nother evolution of soft skills, agile, cloud. You've seen mm -hmm. a tr full transformation with the potential unlimited compute available. Mm -hmm. With mobile now 10 years plus into the iPhone, you see new infrastructure developing. So it creates the notion that, okay, you can bring the science of computers to a whole other level. That must be attractive as you guys have that capability to bring that to bear in the programs. Can you guys comment on how you guys see just the role of computer science uh, playing out. This is not a gender thing, it's just more of, you know, as, as I you know, have oh. a young daughter, I try to say, it's not just writing code. You can certainly whip out a mobile app, but it's really bringing design to it or yes. bringing a personal passion that you might have. So yes. what, what are that? some of the patterns you're seeing in this I, surface I, area of, of what's now known as computer science? I think it's super important because as technology has progressed, 
um, we've been able to provide this program. If, if we were still programming with um, you know, the, the in front of uh, screens and, and doing the what you see is what you get kind of thing without, we would not be there. I think the big thing that's happened in the last 10 years is the mobile phone. I mean, if you find a girl anywhere today in the world, chances are she'll have a mobile phone on her. And she's going to be loath for you to take that one thing from her. You could take other things from her, but try taking that phone away from her. She will not let you. And so the fact that she's so attached to that mobile phone means that you can then tell her, hey, you don't have to be just a consumer of that thing. You can be a producer of that thing. Mm -hmm. Anything that you see on there, you can actually design. This is power. This yeah. is your thing to, 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 to uh, good and great and better. And if we can shift that in their minds that this is their link to the world that's wide open, we're seeing that. Well, the world is consumed by, I mean, a lot of women in the world will be cons consumers of product. Mm -hmm. um, certainly with AI, the conversation over the weekend I was having with folks is the role of women is super important, not just in AI, but as software becomes cognitive, you have to align with half the audience that's out there. Mm -hmm. So um, it's pretty hard for a guy to program something that's going to be more oriented towards a woman. So, but it brings up the question of application and whether it's self-driving cars or utility from, you know, from work to play, and everything in between, software, and the role of software is going to be critical, and that seems to be pretty, pretty clear. The question is, how do you inspire young girls? That's the, that's the question that a lot of um, fellow males that I talk to who are fathers of daughters and or are, are promoting women in tech and, and, and see that vision. What are some of the inspiration areas? How do you really shake the interest, and how do you have someone really kind of dig in and enjoy it and taste it? And, and right. feel it. Right. So, uh, so there's some research to back like the, what the formula is that works and uh, to drive change in behavior. And so there's this, the, one of the biggest sort of names in cognitive psychology is Albert Bandura. He's a professor at, at, at Stanford. But basically it's the same principles that drive say de-addiction from alcohol or weight loss or any kind of new behavior change. So the first is um, you need to have exposure to someone whom you respect. Um, showing that this is something of meaning. And so the key words are someone you respect, right? And so media can play a very big role here because for scale, right? Otherwise, it's only maybe your teacher or your parent, and if they're not exposed to technology, they can't really affect your... Um, and so, so media can, can play a huge role there. Second is um, the experience itself, right? Like how do you get, make it easy to get started? And um, then it's like learning from video games, right? So you make it very, very easy. Like the first step is just come over here, it'll be fun, there's pizza, come, right? Like your friends are coming. But then the feedback has to be very fast, right? So the first step, and that's where a good curriculum matters, right? So that's where also working on a mobile phone is very appealing, even though May apps is it's not. It's relatable. It's relatable, but the, uh, the feedback is instantaneous, right? And so the programming language that the girls use is block-based, so even though you don't have any prior programming background, you can still build a working app, so that's critical. Then human beings get tired very easily, and so the feedback needs to keep changing, right? It has to be unpredictable. The third piece is um, that of an expectations, right? So you have to have very high expectations. And so that's why this current discussion around cognitive differences in gender, I feel is missing the point because it's not what you're born with, what are you capable of, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we looked at our genetics, we would never go to space, we would never go to like the mm -hmm. deepest parts of the ocean because we're not meant for that, right? Yeah. But we, we had really high visions and ex expectations and so human beings rose to that. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece is less relevant in developed countries, but it's still important. So it's sort of the human energy. We are not a brain dissociated from the body. Yeah. We are connected, right? And so if you're hungry and tired and sleepy, not the right uh, time to sort of make a dramatic change in like your interest. So this is relevant. Like if, you, if for us, we uh, try to figure out which countries are we going to work in. Um, so post-conflict, war-torn areas are not the best yeah. areas to start a new program in. Uh, you need the right partners. So you're right. saying the biological argument of, of course, they're different, men and women. Yes. But it's the capability, that's where people are missing and the And the support boat. system, right? Like, yeah. so have high expectations, provide them with the yeah. right support. But the most important thing is uh, your own yeah. own uh, beliefs in, in that. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, because I think you're, you guys have a great program at Technovation. You mentioned mentors, key part of the formula, most likely. What we hear in the conversations I've had with uh, women peers has been, you know, there's a real call to arms at the executive level now, folks my age in the 50s who were made it, who were there succeeding, 
they really want to give back and they really have recognized the value of having that peer mentorship and then inspiring the young generation, whether it's part of things that we cover like Grace Hopper or Technovations, things that you do, or even just mentoring in their own communities. What does that mentorship look like that you guys see that you'd like to see double down on or areas you'd like to see tweaked or perceptions that are right. need to change? What's your thoughts on mentorship and the role of inspiring young girls? Mentorship for men? Men and women, I mean. Oh, from both. Oh, well, I, I see the mention with women. That's the first step. Right. I have a whole other conversation, in my opinion, that the men need it, training. Right. Not just like go to class and learn how to talk, but mm -hmm. how to empathize. Well, my, my, my big thing has been that, um, you know, when you wanted to encourage women uh, up the ladder in your companies or you want to encourage women to actually get into technical roles, um, that that intent should not be placed in the CSR department of your organization because that speaks volumes, right? Uh, to say, oh, well, that's in the you know social responsibility <laughs> department or the HR. That just says, okay, so you know you, you're not really you don't think we're capable of helping you with your product or service. We're, we're sort of part of this, and it's like, no, you know. So I think you want to mainstream it, which is what a lot of I and D um, things are trying to do. Inclusion now. and diversity. Inclusion and diversity um, uh, tech. To make it part of the fabric, not a department checkbox. Exactly. That's and what you're getting at. Exactly. Right? And you know the 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 um, uh, the evolvement of these departments, right, to include everybody and to make it more diverse, is going to uh, going to be uh, n not frictionless. It, it it will be friction until a time where it won't even be necessary. Yeah. I and D departments sh should have one goal, which is to work themselves out of a job. If they can work themselves out of a job, then then the company would have done, uh, you know, what it needs to be done. But but I think um, meaning it's self-sufficient, it's self-governing. People are humans. It's respect yes. for individuals. Yes. I mean, this is basically comes down to if you look at it as humans, exactly. it takes it. Every conversation could be tabled as what. The per there's a person on the other side. It's a human being, right. not a woman or a white male or whatever. And you know um, they're not there yet, but I mean certainly that would be the end game. So that in that scenario, that department's yeah. out of business. The INR, the Inclusion and Diversity Department, you don't need has one because you job. exactly you don't need one because you know what you're okay. And I think capabilities is really important um, in corporations. Um, and it, this isn't anybody's fault. This is just how it's been done. This has just been the culture of it, right? Um, who gets invited? to which meetings, who gets invited to which conferences, right? And so we heard um, uh, the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, saying, you know, she had to sort of elbow a little bit to say, hey, why, why am I not allowed at a certain conference? And it's like, maybe just wake up to that and say, well, why, why aren't you involving, you know, more people at conferences and, and think yeah. tanks? Because, you know, um, I come from an oil and gas background and people used to do a lot of deals on, on the golf course because oil and gas people play golf a lot and a lot of deals used to happen. Well, in the Valley, we don't play golf a lot, but we do do other things, conferences or, or, yeah. or get-togethers. And, and if you don't include the people in your team as, as groups or, or representationally, yeah. well, they, they're not going to be there when, when you make these decisions. So maybe just be a little Exclusionary bit Exclusionary is a problem. And Kleiner Perkins was uh, taken to task. They had ski trips apparently planned, and they didn't almost yeah. the guys and they didn't invite the woman partner it was a big scandal but this is where they kind of make that no it's a normative thing and they got to change the norms it ch change the norms and if you actually want your company which is made of all kinds of people to move really far ahead don't don't be like that include everybody because the only goodness about that is you'll go forward. You don't include somebody, yeah. well, you're going to hurt them. I want to add to that. So there's quite a bit of data. So the patterns are not anything different from what the message girls get from school and parents, right? So if you look at the data, there are 100 countries that legally discriminate against women. And so what industry is, what message industry is telling is really, firstly, it doesn't filter through to the larger population. Silicon Valley is a completely different bubble. Right, but overall, the message is girls are given is like, this is not for you, right? And so, especially in some of the most sort of populous, uh, dense countries in the world. And so we have to fight a lot of these kinds of uh, um, perceptions from the ground up, right? And the, the number one sort of gatekeeper is the father. 
And so a key part of what we have not done to date is to provide sort of education and training to the parents because um, there's a very moving story that uh, we work in a remote uh, town in South India and a mentor who's very dedicated has been trying to get these girls to participate in technovation. They did, he did that and then there were one girl was actually offered a job but the father kept sort of saying no, not needed, no girl in my family ever needs to work but he fought, he fought it and so then the girl actually gets a job. And then uh, a year later, the father calls the mentor and said, you know what, I'm so grateful that you did it because a day after she got the job, I got hit in an accident and I lost my job. But it's these kinds of uh, perceptions that have to be changed one person at a time, which is what makes this very hard. Yeah. Um, unless you actually are able to get the, the media um, to change sort of the, the, the messaging. And I think, in the US, which is, there's some very interesting studies and a question, right? Like, if you were to think, um, would there be more women in STEM in poorer developing countries versus richer, highly developed countries? Where would you see more women in STEM? The answer is actually the, the women in like poorer countries like Iran, Malaysia. The reason is because in an individualistic society like in the US, uh, where there's a lot of emphasis on materialistic, but it's also about, are you happy? the conversation has changed to from parents telling children, do what makes you happy. And then you're very prone to advertising, and advertising works when it's highly targeted and highly gendered. And so in the 60s, there was no such thing as pink and blue. Now there is pink and blue, right? And so now we just made our entire society entirely susceptible to advertising, right? And like girls are, are passive and compliant, and boys are aggressive, right? And so then when you're looking at the board structures, there's no, it's very, very hard to fix the problem right there, right? Yep. You have to go down deeper because you don't get leaders who are compliant. Maybe secretaries are compliant, right? But you have to fix the message that teachers give girls, that um, parents give their baby girls when they're born. And so industry is just sort of in the spotlight right now, but the issue is not that of industry. I think it's also Industry, if you look at what Sundar is supporting you guys, it's interesting that this industry seems to be chipping and certainly Silicon Valley is a little bit different, as you said, but in general, it is a, cultural mm -hmm. parent thing. Any plans there with Technovations to have a parent <laughs> track? Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. totally. I mean, I think right now 10% of parents actually volunteer to be mentors, kind of like, say, Girl Scout troop yeah. leaders. And so we are trying to figure out, okay, what is a way to I involve parents and to make them part of the discussion? Tara Nar, thanks so much. This is the Cube Conversation here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. Uh -huh.